Dr. Lauren Fitz, and I'm joined by my beautiful co-host, Miss Jessica Young. What's up, girl? Hey, girl. Hey. What's up? How you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing? Well, you know, you know. <laughs> Today's episode, I'm. Uh, there's a lot of hype about it, right? Um, and right. It, I'm going to warn the audience that this may or may not go into a two-part episode because today's episode is all about glucose monitoring. And I know some people that maybe have just, you know, happened to, to come across this and don't know who I am, um, haven't been watching what I've been doing for the last 21 days. Um, but there's a lot of people that follow us closely that know exactly what I'm talking about, the continuous glucose monitor that I have been wearing and there are so many questions so I want to start off by first of all saying thank you to all of you who have left questions um been following closely sharing um the Instagram my Instagram is Dr. Lauren Fitz and um I love teaching and I love giving you guys potential knowledge that is potentially powerful if you apply it to your life and I believe that this is some of the most powerful knowledge that I have taught yet okay um, secondly I want to give you guys heads up because preparing for these episodes actually takes a lot of time and I know a lot of you have asked how can I support you um, we actually just created a patreon account for those of you that even if you want to give us a dollar I don't care, but any support for all of the work that we got, we do for you guys behind the scenes is super helpful. So patreon.com forward slash fits and healthy is where you can go. And we don't have anything up there yet, but for those of you that um, sign up to become our Patreon supporters before the end of the year, um, we have something special for you. So I can't tell you what it is yet, but um, that being said, let's just get straight into the episode because we have a lot to cover and I want to make sure that we are live on Facebook um, we're on the club fits fitness like page currently right now and so I'm hoping that those of you that are watching it live will have some good questions for me because we're gonna we're gonna basically talk about an hour and then I'm gonna open it up I have my other computer right here and Jess and I are gonna actually ask answer your questions okay um, but for those people that are not um, that have no idea what the CGM experiment was. Let me just give a, a brief synopsis, okay? So um, I should have worn a, a, a short sleeve so I can show my CGM for those of you that watch the, the uh, mm -hmm. podcast via video. But um, I got this idea after using a blood glucose monitor on my clients that I coach online. And I've used it now for almost three years. I've been coaching, health coaching for about four years. And I realized that the the more data that people that I coach have to track, the easier it is for them to stay on track. So, you know, some of the data that, that I have them send me are inches monthly. Um, some people plus or minus that are not obsessed with their weight will send me the number on the scale. Um, people will send me pictures. So it's data that they can track and blood pressure and blood glucose are two basic vital signs that when I was practicing medicine full time, I would look at and it would tell me a whole lot about a patient. And actually blood glucose isn't officially a blood uh, a vital sign, but I think it should be um, because it tells so much about what is going on inside of a patient. Okay. So um, I will start this off by having a few disclaimers. And I know at the end of every show, I do have my medical legal disclaimer that I am a doctor, but not your medical doctor. She my doctor. <laughs> She always says that. <laughs> but I also want to just tell you, I am not a nutrition expert. I don't have a nutrition degree. Um, I'm not an RD. Um, and I will never claim to be a nutrition expert because we are learning so much and so much um, of what we need to learn will probably never be adequately studied because there aren't huge companies that can make a lot of money from the outcome that my gut tells me will ultimately tell us how we should eat. Okay. So I am not claiming to be a nutrition expert. So those of you that are on your high horse, like, well, I'm an RD or I'm a holistic nutrition certified, whatever. That's cool. This is my end of one experiment. And that is one thing that the listeners cannot take away from me is that I am just experimenting on myself. My N of one is me. And I am showing you what I saw in the 21 days of doing this CGM test. So CGM stands for continuous glucose monitor. 
And instead of pricking your finger and testing your blood glucose in the little glucometer that anyone can buy, like you do not have to be a diabetic to buy these little glucometers online. In fact, I always tell my customers, I would prefer for you to get it because a lot of people don't realize that they are either already type two diabetic or on the verge of becoming a type two diabetic. Okay. And I'm going to briefly talk about the difference between type one and type two, but this talk is mostly for people that are not type one because the, the pathophysiology, the big word, how, what happens with a type one diabetic is totally different than what we see in a majority of people. Most people have type two diabetes. And this is the thing that I a hundred percent believe that is reversible and preventable. Okay. So, um, so this, this blood glucose now, Jessica, do you own a blood glucometer? Uh, no. You, so you've never done this experiment with yourself. No, but I am going to do it. You are. Yes. Yes, I am going to do it. But um, actually, I just told Keldrick that before we got on, I was like, we're going to have to do this. And I was telling him about you doing it. But yes, we are going to do it, but I don't want own one at the moment. No, no, no. Okay, cool. Well, the good thing is um, there are a lot of great monitors. I chose to uh, buy the Precision XR on Amazon that can measure both my blood glucose and my blood ketones. And I'm going to explain I am not a keto person, but I will tell you all, out of all of the diets, I felt good on all of the diets that I was eating a low carb lifestyle. So I like to consider myself a low carb doctor. Um, and we're so Okay, so let's rewind. So 21 days ago, it, it was actually um, it, it, three weeks ago, I started this whole experiment where um, I actually had a very kind follower um, tell me that she would send me, she, she is a type 1 diabetic, and I had talked about possibly doing this CGM test on myself. But CGM monitors, and, and I'm, I'm, stop, I'm not going to say continuous glucose monitor anymore. I'm assuming that you know CGM stands for that, right? So a CGM monitor is right now, which I'm hoping that we can change this, and uh, maybe the right person is going to hear this and I can collab with them to make this change. But currently right now, the only CGMs um, that you can get are through a doctor's prescription, and they're really expensive, and they're only for type 1 diabetics. So even if you are a type 2 diabetic, I have been told from other type 2 diabetics that insurance does not cover them. So I was willing to invest in this apparatus, which the apparatus literally, it's it looks like you know a little tiny cell phone. Um, and once you have that apparatus, you need a sensor, okay? So the apparatus was a I've been told $600. Um, and, and so I know a lot of people have thought about doing this on their own. I'm like, hey, if you have that extra kind of cash flowing around, cool. Uh, but most people don't. So I'm going to tell people how to do this own self-experiment if you don't want to invest a lot of, of money, right? Um, but mm -hmm. the, the actual CGM device that I used was called a Freestyle Libra. Um, the two most common ones um, that are on the market right now are the Freestyle Libra and the Dexcom. But I've been told that the Dexcom is the most common one that type one diabetics use because it has not only a monitor that monitors when, like tells the patient when their blood glucose is dangerously low, but it also has the ability to connect to a continuous insulin pump. Okay, so it's a little complicated, but the point is a Dexcom is the most common one. I used the Freestyle Libra and the way that I put it on, actually, it didn't hurt at all. Um, it looked the the sensor has an, um, an applicator that basically looks like a big stamp and the instructions are super easy to, to follow. You basically stamp it on the backside of your arm and the, the place, the way that it inserts, it's this tiny little needle and you don't feel it all. It doesn't hurt at all. All. And the tiny little needle goes into your subcutaneous tissue. So this is actually not officially blood glucose monitoring. It's actually testing the glucose in your subcutaneous tissue. But I used my blood glucometer to mirror and see how close it was. And it was always within about 10 points. Milligrams per deciliter is, is what it's, it's measured in. Okay. Um, so Three weeks ago, I decided to do the CGM test. I, I, I used self, uh, hashtag self CGM test. And I wanted to use this device to show the people that follow me what food does to your glucose. Okay. Um, ultimately, because 
I believe that type two diabetes is, if not one of the worst, definitely. It, it's definitely one of the worst. I might call it the worst disease to have. Um, being a practicing anesthesiologist for so many years, I saw, I had so many patients that were getting their feet chopped off, getting, losing fingers and toes, um, having strokes, having heart attacks, losing their sight, um, needing to be on dialysis, which basically means their kidneys stop working. Why is this? It's because if you think about a slow drip of battery acid on something it slowly eats away and ultimately ends up making that that whatever it's being dripped on just ruined right well when our blood glucose has an elevated level of sugar it's like slow drip of battery acid to all of our organs and that's why when you have a, a patient that has end stage diabetes it looks miserable because it's not just one organ system that's affected. It's all organ systems because these, pa these patients have been walking around with really high levels of blood glucose because their pancreas, which is the organ that produces insulin, basically just can't keep up and keeps producing insulin, pr producing insulin to the point that their blood glucose just stays chronically high. So that, that slow drip of battery acid slowly breaks down your kidneys, slowly breaks down your eyesight, slowly breaks down your nerves so that when you step on an attack, you can't feel it because you have what's called a neuropathy because those nerves have been exposed to these high levels of sugar. And basically it's just a slow death for your organs. And I am trying mm -hmm. to paint this picture and scare the the hell out of you because I want you to be scared and I want you to be scared, but I also want you to be educated knowing that if you have this disease, depending on how far along this curve you are, you can reverse it. Okay. My hope is to catch you right here at the lower part of the curve instead of at the latter part of the curve. Cause by the time that you have end stage organ disease, like kidney failure and you need dialysis, it's, almost well it, it is too late to reverse that end stage damage um so my hope is that this experiment is going to speak to all of you and then also make sure that all of you realize that i know some of you are thinking well i'm not overweight so i'm not at risk bs and and i'm going to tell you why so um i don't know if you saw jessica you're not a morning person so i guess you i'm guessing that you probably <laughs> didn't see my post um but i i posted this morning to, to let them know um, there is one thing that, that everyone can do to potentially be diabetic. Do you by chance know what that is? This is a trick no. question. Okay. Well, no. it's not a trick question. I didn't question. see the post either. That's okay. That's okay. So um, I truly believe that, well, let's, let's rewind back. The one thing that you can do, I'm going to tell you, is because so many Americans are doing this, is over consuming carbohydrates okay now some of you are gonna be like okay low carb i'm done listening to this no stop just give me give me this hour to teach you okay because so many people this this current atmosphere of the diet and nutrition world is so it's like there's animosity and there's hatred and there's like fighting like i'm a vegan and i'm paleo and, and i'm keto and like let's just fight it's dumb um because if we can all just rise together and get the vast majority of the world to realize that it's not so much one particular diet is the end all be all, but what one thing that everyone needs to do is they need to cut out fake foods, processed foods. And that's why mm -hmm. if you have someone and this is a com, and I'm not anti vegan, but I will at the end of this, I will let you guys know which one that I felt best on. Um, but I will let you know that when people switch from, let's say the standard American diet to a vegan diet, all of a sudden they feel great. Well, of course they do. It's not just because it's vegan. It's because they've gotten rid of the crappy processed foods that do all sorts of stuff. So that being said, do you remember the first diet that I started with Jessica? Yes, the SAD diet. The SAD. And what does the yes. SAD stand for? Standard American diet. Yes. Okay. So sad. It's so sad. And, you know, I actually, so I did that. So three days, the first three days of this 21-day experiment were doing the SAD diet. And I 
specifically chose these three days because <laughs> these were the three days that Chris and I took a little mini vacation to California. And um, I literally, I ate like what I think a standard American would, would eat like. And I I had the point made that I really didn't eat like the average American because ultimately right. as close to eating the standard American diet as I did, I felt so bad. I mean, and that's what we were talking about last night. Yes. I figured you would. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I actually, because on the weekends I typically don't work. And so I recorded all my blood glucoses, but the audience hasn't even seen how out of control my blood glucose was for those three days that I was eating the standard American diet. But let me tell you, um, for those of you that are new to following me, I'm 39, about to be 40. And about five years ago, I went to see a, a, a naturopathic doctor and got like a full workup and, and all of this blood test and whatnot. And um, to my surprise, it already showed that I was on the verge of becoming um, insulin resistant. It showed that I had beta cell dysfunction, which I'm going to, I'm going to get geeky and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But um, at that point mm. in my life, I, well, I wasn't overweight. I was, was working out hardcore. I was following the standard, not the standard American diet, what the, the dietary guidelines recommend us to eat. So a low fat diet, eating five to six times a, a day. Think about the food pyramid, right? The six to 11 grain uh, servings of whole healthy grains, which we're going to talk about that. Um, that's what I was following. And that's what I told my patients to, to follow for literally over a decade. Right. And that's, I mean, Jessica, mm -hmm. have, you've probably followed that recommendation too, right? Right. So, um, it, it scared me. And that, that was when I realized like, okay, not, you don't have to just be overweight or obese to be worried about type two diabetes. And I knew this, but I, my understanding of this process has gone to a whole new level. And this 21 day experiment confirmed a lot of what I already knew, but I also learned a lot about myself. So I'm mm -hmm. going to be posting those, those sad numbers of the blood glucose, but let me tell you that, um, there, my blood glucose, there were times that it would go below 100, but most of the time it stayed elevated above 100 and, and that is not good. So Jessica, do you know what the, the standard recommendation for blood glucose numbers are? No. Okay. So let's talk about that. So these numbers are, are in milligrams per deciliter. So if you have a fasting blood glucose that is 125 or over, I'm, I'm concerned about type 2 diabetes. If you are between 100 and 125, then with fasting blood glucose, then I'm concerned that you're pre-diabetic. And then 90 to 100, you're not yet pre-diabetic, but I would love for you to be the optimal, which is less than 90, preferably between about 70 and 90. And, and people that saw my, my experiment, those were the, the ranges that I set to be the upper limits of high and low, right? Yeah, I figured that was the, I mean, I didn't know the exact number, but just from looking at your thing, I figured like what was probably too high or just by, you know, your results and stuff you were saying. Right. Right. So, um, the, you know, I don't eat much fried foods, right? Like very rarely I can count on one hand, how many times I've eaten something fried so in the last to year. Alabama and eat fried chicken. Yeah, that too. <laughs> your, your mama's fried chicken is legit though. Uh, that was totally worth it. <laughs> yeah. It's worth two blood sugar going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um the the first night on the standard american diet we were in laguna beach and the the entree that the the guy recommended was their fried chicken fried rosemary chicken and and potato whatever so i'm like all right i'm going all out and oh my gosh <laughs> now granted it tasted good i'm not gonna lie it tasted good but the aftermath of not just the blood glucose, but let's just talk about the GI tract. OMG. It was not good. Painful. Painful. Like was it like cramping or cramping? And then the what came out on the, the other side was not so, good yeah. either. It like literally my body was like, what the hell are you doing to me? 
So, yeah. the, you know, the, the, the moment on the lips uh, and lifetime on the hips, it's kind of like that. Like it tasted good for the, you know, 15 minutes that I was enjoying the entree, but the aftermath and how long it lasted, it's just not worth it. So, right. so the sad diet, I'm not going to spend too much time because if you're listening to this, I'm hoping that you have realized that the sad diet is, you know, you hopefully you've never eaten it or it, you've left it behind in the past. Right. So, you know, what I was really, um, what really got me though, because you know, you're supposed to eat oatmeal for breakfast. That's what you're supposed to eat. And yep. when you're eating the oatmeal and it went up, cause even with trainers, I know when I used to, when people used to train me, they was like, okay, oatmeal for breakfast and this and I'm, and everything that they were saying, like, was not good. We thought we think it's good for us, but we're not. But I thought that was a good one because people, personal trainers usually say oatmeal. Yes. That's the number one thing to eat for breakfast in the morning. Yes. So that's perfect segue to the next three days of my 21 day self CGM test because the next three days I did the low fat diet, basically what our diet, our government dietary guidelines tell us to eat the food pyramid. And I, ultimately tried to eat the way I remember I used to eat for all of my 20s and the first half of my 30s, okay? What I thought was super healthy, okay? And so the very first day, I, I, and I did not practice intermittent fasting. A lot of you guys know that I am a huge proponent of intermittent fasting, and it is uh, a tool that I use with pretty much all of my clients. Um, but I did not intermittent in, did not practice IF during um, the SAD diet or the low fat diet because those are not standards for both of those diets. So, um, so the low fat diet started and I ate breakfast first thing. And the first day I ate oatmeal and blueberries. And for all intents and purposes, everyone's like, but yeah, but that's healthy, right? <laughs> well, um, it depends on what your definition of healthy is. So my blood glucose went up to, and I'm going to actually do a write up on this so people can actually see all of these numbers and see the graphs and whatnot. But my blood glucose went up to, I believe it was 150, 150, 155. Okay. And that was a, an hour later. So what I did was I measured it 30 minutes post and, and one hour post. And then I, I typically would do it either 90 minutes later or two hours after I was done eating. And, um, and, not only did the it spike my blood glucose up, but 90 minutes later, I found myself feeling really hungry and I checked my blood glucose and sure enough, I believe it was 59, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, um, what I believe is that, and, and you know, this goes against a lot of, you know, nutrition programs and in, including, you know, a company that I'm uh, uh, associated with. We, we have a, a nutrition program that's, it's all about timed nutrition and, and multiple meals a day. And I don't believe in that. And I'll tell you why, because the, what happens from eating um, the food every two to three hours, you are never giving your, your pancreas a break. Okay. So what happens when you, you eat food, right? You ingest it into your mouth, it goes down your esophagus, it goes into your mm -hmm. stomach, and then it goes into your small intestines, and then your large intestines, and then the rectum, and then it's out, right? So that whole track, mm -hmm. um, the main purpose of your intestines is to digest and basically take in all of the stuff that the body can use and excrete the stuff the body can't, right? I eat poop. Now, <laughs> I just wanted to say that word because everyone's asking, are you going to talk about your GI stuff? I'm like, yes, there will be a talk lot of about doo -doo. I'm going to talk about doo-doo. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, for the longest time, I thought that my constant hunger <laughs> was just because I had a high metabolism. <laughs> right. That was the thing that, I, girl, your metabolism just high. You got to. <laughs> Eat, 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 because you know your girl be eating every hour. Yeah. It's a little, still a little high to go slow down by the time I get a little older. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, we've been taught so wrong. Right? It, it is. And, Crazy. And, and the reason why you are always super hungry within an hour and a half, two hours after that healthy breakfast is because of what it is. And what I want the audience to understand is that the powers that influence what we believe 
go way beyond what you understand. So when you hear me talk about big food and big pharma, um, these are trillion dollar industries that would literally go belly up if all of a sudden we wake up tomorrow and everyone's like, okay, I'm going to eat a whole foods based nutrition. I'm going to stop buying fake processed foods, no foods in, in boxes or packages or whatever. I'm just going to eat what I think that humans ate for two and a half million years before we had this whole like, you know, food industry thing because. Right. And saying that, what, like when people say we wasn't meant to eat meat. Oh, uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to oh, that. Oh God! Okay, See, good. that's why that's why I knew that this is going to be two parts because I'm I'm looking at my timer and we're already at 26 minutes. I'm like I haven't even gotten to the good stuff yet. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, so this this will the part two will be recorded next week. I, I I will let you guys know. Um, but we will talk about that. And and I am not gonna. I'm not going to throw shade to any different kind of diet except for the standard American diet and the low fat diet. Um, I, I believe that those cause harm. I believe that those cause disease and those lead to all of the bad stuff that we are seeing. Right. And it's, it is so obvious if you look at all of the graphs of obesity, diabetes, um, autoimmune disorders, cancers, like it correlates perfectly with when, all of a sudden our food started changing and all of a sudden we started having these basically food made by food chemists and food chemists that really focus on how I can get the consumer to buy more because that pays their life. Right. Um, so, so the constant super spike and super drop Think about a, um, a graph that goes up and down, up and down, and has big, huge, like a roller coaster swings, ups and downs, right? That right there is basically your body. Well, one, it's because that's the reason why you're always feeling hungry. That's why you're always feeling lethargic after meals. Um, it's why you never give your pancreas a rest and it's always spitting out insulin. Um, and it's the reason why you probably have, um, what's, what's called fatty liver disease. Okay. And so I, I want to, do you know what foie gras is? Foie gras. <laughs> I can't say it correctly either. It's a French. No, uh, no. <laughs> no, <I don't. laughs> no. <laughs> I <don't. laughs> That was awesome. Don't don't feel bad. So I did not know what foie gras was until um, I was I was 21. I was an exchange student living in Spain, and um, my roommate had a, a cousin that lived in Paris. And I, you know, while I was an exchange student, I wanted to travel as much as possible. So I went to Paris. Um, their family's culture. They're from Morocco, and their family's culture is you treat a guest like royalty. So. I got to spend a week in Paris and literally was treated like royalty. And so uh, a, a French um, delicacy is called foie gras, which basically is the, um, it's a pate. It's a liver pate from duck and geese. Okay. It's, and it's actually really good. There's so many nutrients in it. It's, but it, it's a delicacy. It's very expensive and um, it's, it's French, right? So mm -hmm. the reason I'm telling you this is because um, I don't know how many hundreds of years ago, farmers realized that they could fatten up the duck liver very quickly so that they could make foie gras. And how did they do that? They did it by basically having a feeding tube and force feeding these these geese and, and these ducks, a huge diet full of all carbohydrates and it automatically fattened up their liver. Now, why am I telling you this? Because fatty liver is the first step to be to developing type two diabetes. And this is why if you are not overweight, that does not mean that you cannot develop diabetes. And in fact, a lot of you, and if one of my dearest friends from California who literally is super skinny, the last person that anyone would ever think is a type 2 diabetic, she just announced on her social media that she got the diagnosis. And and this is why I just, I want everyone to understand, like, I know that, you know, some of you are thinking, well, I don't have any diabetics in my family, or I'm not overweight, or I'm not, you know, this particular race, I don't care. I can make anyone diabetic by making their insulin 
become hyperinsulinemia. Okay. So, so, uh, excess carbohydrates over time, I believe will lead to type two diabetes in pretty much almost everyone. Okay. Um, this is why I am a huge com- uh, proponent of a low carb lifestyle. So I, I just want to, is, are, are there any questions as far as the low fat part? Because we, we've covered the sad and we've covered the low fat, but I really want to spend a majority of the time on the rest of the diets because the next three days I went to high fat, low carb, and then I went to three days of keto. And then I went to three days of the carnivore diet. And those are, that was the, I knew that was the one I was missing. I was thinking, what was the last one you did? Yeah. Um, Oh, and I can't forget before I did all of the lower carb lifestyles, I went vegan for three days. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so should we just go ahead and jump into the vegan thing? Yes, we should. (laughs) Okay. So yeah. Now I was looking at time. Yeah, I've got my timer right here. (laughs) We're good. We're good. Um, So if a a patient or a customer comes to me and gives me two options of standard American diet versus vegan, I'm going to choose vegan all the time. Absolutely. If those are my only two options. Mm -hmm. Um, But ultimately, the reason why I like the vegan option over the standard American diet or even the low fat is because we're getting rid of fat food or we're getting rid of, of freaking foods, fake foods, right? Mm -hmm. Because the standard American diet is full of fake foods, processed foods, foods that have additives, um, preservatives, uh, artificial dyes, chemicals that are, are not supposed to be ingested. Um, and so that, that is why I would prefer for them to be vegan. Now I, tried my best to eat a higher fat, lower carbohydrate lifestyle as a vegan. And I found it really hard. (laughs) Um, I, this is something that anytime someone works with me, they ask, can I do a high fat, low carb lifestyle as a vegan? Mm -hmm. And I let them know, yes, but it isn't easy. And my experience was that, um, it was hard for me to get enough protein where I felt completely satiated And my blood glucose was still all over the place. It wasn't as bad as the standard American diet and the low fat diet, but because a lot of, of what vegans eat, a lot of their protein sources come from grains and legumes. Um, those, those definitely spiked my blood glucose and Mm -hmm. the three days that I was a vegan, my energy level was actually really low and I don't, it, totally could have been it was really cold and gray skies here but i just remember yawning all day and um i will talk about the gas can i talk about the gas <laughs> i'm just gonna be honest um i even in the first day i didn't take digestive enzymes um just because i wanted to see what what the real effect was of eating like i made this whole quinoa, um, sprouted lentils and organic black bean bowl. Like I, I did vegan as if, if I were going to go vegan, how I think that I would do it. Right. I I did Mm -hmm. all organic, non GMO, like healthy options. Right. Uh, cause we know plenty of people that do vegan in a really unhealthy way. And they're not, yes. And they're not doing it right. And they don't have no energy. They wonder why they're always hungry and all this stuff. Cause you have to have a a plan when you go instead of just saying you know what i ain't gonna eat no meat I'm right done eating meat and right. that's what i was saying earlier like this girl that i know she was like well i stopped eating meat because meat is not good for you it's killing everybody and it's just like we just shouldn't eat that it's something that we shouldn't eat and you know you mean i just sit back and mind my business <laughs> I don't yep. say nothing unless somebody asks me something. I can know a whole lot about it, and I ain't going to say nothing. I'm just going to sit back and look because it ain't none of my business. But And all the other people was like, yeah, you're right. We should not eat meat. I was like, y'all, what do y'all think they was eating a thousand years ago? Like, now the meat is bad, but if you have good processed meat, because she was sitting there chomping on a cucumber and was hungry because she said she'd been eating cucumbers all day. Oh, goodness. Like... <laughs> So people don't really like, they lack the knowledge of yes, going. Absolutely. Vegan. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we're going to talk about, um, dirty vegan, dirty keto, uh, you know, cause the, the fact is I, I see people, I, I just literally shake my head because if you're going vegan, 
and you're buying all of these vegan products. And hopefully most people that are listening to this also follow me on my stories and know that I take people shopping every Wednesday, except for Wednesdays that you're water fasting because that's just wrong. <laughs> so I did not go grocery shopping yesterday because I'm on my, I was on my first day of my water fast, but um, neither here nor there. But what most people that have learned following me on my Insta stories is that there are a majority of vegan products are full of of highly processed ingredients and fake ingredients and not any mm -hmm. better, if not worse for you. Right. And people still don't get that. Sometimes the label, they just smack the uh, organic thing on there because they know you're going to buy. <sighs> like you have to really ingredient. Yeah. It's yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and there's, there is actually a thing it's called greenwashing and food companies know that the more that they can make the label look like, a healthy item with like big, uh, you know, a, a big one is mm -hmm. non GMO. Well, guess what? There's actually only a very small handful of crops that are genetically modified organisms. So I can literally say, Hey, this phone is genetically, isn't genetically modified. And uh, okay. All right. That, that, that's what greenwashing is. Right. So, you know, the fact is that, um, you, you have to be aware. You always have to look at ingredients and we're, we're going to be talking about meat. Is it good? Is it bad or not? Because there are, there are a lot of people that stand to make a lot of money if they can get the vast majority of Americans to believe that going vegan is the best way to go. So let me just give you an example there. And now about once a year, there's always some big documentary that comes out on Netflix that, you know, it's, it's mostly propaganda. Right. And, um, and after that, you know, documentary comes out, I'm, my inbox is full of, oh, did you see what the hell did you, what do you think? Did you see what game changers? That? Right. And so the most recent one is called game changers. And I will be honest. Um, Chris, Chris hasn't even watched it. And he was like, you know, I was thinking about going vegan. I'm like, no, babe. <laughs> he was like, well, I heard that about this documentary and it's, it's, it looks at athletes. And I'm like, no. He said he was thinking about going vegan. Yes. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's his own man. He will do if he, if what he wants, but, but he does yield to my, my advice when it comes to the, says the hold on guys says the same person that threw all the ice cream and junk out when she moved to Chicago. <laughs> I mean, it's a minor detail. It's a so minor. my point is he probably listened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> now Keldrick, didn't he go vegan for, cause he's not vegan anymore. Right. Yeah. He got back with me and he, <laughs> <laughs> so Keldrick stopped eating meat for two years. Okay. So I mean, Keldrick got back together. He hadn't like, he didn't eat meat for two years and he, cause he had gained a lot of weight. So he started cutting out meat and lost a whole lot of weight, got really um, healthy or whatever. But yeah, he wasn't eating meat, but he was eating pasta all the time. Okay. So, but, so, so when he, when we got back together, he started back, but he's still careful about what he eats. Like he's not going to eat any pork and it's usually like just chicken or fish, but he eats meat now, but it's just certain stuff that he doesn't, doesn't eat. But he said he felt a whole lot better. Absolutely. Um, and, and the thing that I want the listeners to understand is that he could have gone from what he was eating to vegan, what he was eating to paleo, what he was eating to high fat, low carb. If you go from this, the, what most Americans are eating to a healthier diet, which typically looks like more whole foods and less processed foods. So a vegan, you automatically think of more vegetables. Of course, your body is going to feel better. And mm -hmm. a lot of people call the, the first uh, up to four years of um, people's vegans life is the honeymoon period, because this is when they feel super great. But then over the years, the deficiencies that they're not getting from being an omnivore versus just eating vegetables and, and, you know, plants, um, start to catch up with them. And, and right. so this documentary that I was talking about, so first of all, it was produced by James Cameron. So he is one of the most well-known wealthiest producers in, in like entertainment industry. And James Cameron invested a hundred, I believe $40 million in the company that does 
plant-based protein. So James Cameron has major incentive to make you want to believe that plant-based is the only way. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why when I say propaganda and they're actually if I don't know if you listen to Joe Rogan, um, but Joe Rogan has had some great people on his show to debunk the game changers. I I didn't even waste my time debunking it because I knew that people that are far smarter and have (laughs) access to, to better resources than me are we're going to be able to debunk it. But there are were a lot of fallacies in the the game changers and they they misled a lot of people when they say uh, plant based. Uh, a few of those people were plant based, mostly plant based, but still ate fish and still, you know, whatever. And this this documentary was made over over the last five years. So a lot of the athletes that they focused on actually and specifically Cam Newton um, have had injuries that uh, a lot of people speculate are due to the change of going from an omnivore diet to a vegan diet because they're mm-hmm. lacking some some vital um, vital it, nutrients basically that that helps with with um joint health and whatnot so i am not here to to bash vegans but um that that way of eating for me um made my blood glucose go way too much up and down um i i didn't i felt better eating as a vegan when i compared it to the low fat diet and then definitely when compared to the standard american diet but the next diet that I did for three days was the beginning of when I really just felt awesome. And that was the high fat, low carb diet. Mm-hmm. So, um, any, any other thoughts or, or comments about the vegan diet before we move on? No. We'll be right back to the Fits and Healthy podcast after this commercial break. Hello and welcome. I'm Adam. And I'm Richard. Ever wish you could make an impact in your community, become a better leader, influence positive change? Then check us out every Tuesday for in-depth interviews into the lives of the leaders and influencers in the great state of Oklahoma, those that are bringing the change and making the impact. We will shine the spotlight on the things that they and their organizations are doing to make the lives of fellow Oklahomans better. Check us out on Podbean, Spotify, and iTunes every Tuesday and subscribe, listen, rate, and share. Also follow us on Facebook at Adam and Rich in the forum and Instagram and Twitter on AR15 in the 405. Take a shot with AR15 in the 405. Hey, this is your boy Frog. I'm here with Chris, Justin, and Philip, and we host Turn On The Game, the podcast. The show consists of four men commentating on the sports world. It's strictly opinion shows as if you were sitting on the couch watching a game with your boys. And you can follow us on Twitter at TurnOnThe underscore game. You can hit us up on our Facebook page at TurnOnTheGame. And you can even follow us on Instagram at TurnOnTheGame. Or you can listen to us on Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher by searching Turn On The Game. You can email us at TurnOnTheGame, the number four at gmail.com. Turn on the Game is sponsored by Blackened Studios, Oklahoma City's premier podcasting studio. Turn on. And now back to Fits and Healthy. Because I literally... Oh, and I and then I think, like you were saying, we're not bashing vegan. I think it's good to do if you know what you're doing. True. Like, a lot of people go into it and they don't know what they're doing. They're not getting the nutrients they need because they don't really know how to do it. So if you do the research and you know what you're doing, then cool. Right. But, but, if, but, but not, it can hurt you absolutely. worse because the girl that I was coaching and Lauren, you know me, my patience sometimes short. <laughs> Very. And she was like, well, she was so much like she wanted to do the vegan, whatever. And I was like, cool. Like, just to make sure, like, we'll make sure you're doing it the right way. But she was so adamant on doing her smoothies. So she was drinking two smoothies a day and not like Shakeology. I mean, smoothies like mango, strawberry, spinach. She was drinking that two times a day. And then she was eating a meal and she looked sick. Yeah. And I was like, when you're able to follow my directions, then we can then work further. Because I don't want you to be going around telling me, girl, yeah, I'm, I'm working with Jessica. And you, I didn't tell her that, but that's what I was thinking. Like, I'm working with Jessica. And she was, she was like, she was looking sick, but it was because, but she was losing the weight, but it wasn't a healthy, it no. wasn't healthy. You know, 
like if you want to do it, but just know like research and make sure you're eating the right stuff. There are plenty of doctors that uh, that I follow online and have podcasts that I listen to that uh, I hear this consistently that are still practicing that are like functional medicine doctors, which by the way, I'm, I'm going to be one of those in, in the near future, but that's another, another podcast. <laughs> um, but I am excited about that. Um, but many functional medicine doctors that I follow have talked about how their vegan patients are some of the most unhealthy patients. So uh, like, I know that some people are like, I just want to lose weight, but guys, it's more than just losing weight. Like, yes. You, you have to understand like, your health is your most valuable thing. And if you aren't feeling awesome nine times out of 10, every single day, full of energy, your skin is looking good. Your hair is looking good. Your GI tract is looking good or looking functioning. Good <laughs> your sleep is functioning. Good. Like you're, then you have room for improvement because ultimately I can tell you from this side, like I wake up and feel amazing every day. And I think I've taken for granted what feeling good feels like after going to the standard American diet and the low fat and the vegan for a while. Right. And it was only, and that's why I tell, tell people too, you don't know how bad you feel until you really start feeling good. Exactly. For real. Because I used to be like, I feel good. I feel. And then when I really, you know, I always been an athlete. So working out is second nature, but I haven't always been in, like have my food on point right when I started I was like dang I didn't know I felt that bad right right no it's it's truly it people don't understand what it like there's so many people that have been literally walking around for decades and they don't know what it feels like to feel good and then the moment that we start to change what they eat all of a sudden there's this epiphany like oh my gosh and you know I I am I haven't come up with what I want to call this because I want to, I want to come up with a hashtag and maybe our followers can help me, but I want to create a movement that creates awareness, especially January is right around the corner. And what is the first thing that everyone does in January? They want to work out. Thank you. They're getting Thank their body together. This is it. This is my year to lose the weight, girl. We going three weeks later. I <laughs> got it. No, but, but the point is the very first thing that you said was work out because that's the first thing that everyone thinks. And while I am a huge proponent of exercise, I believe that we were meant to move and, and work our body every day. Exercise is not the key to losing weight. And, and I want to create a movement where January comes and people start to think, okay, I'm going to get my nutrition in order because mm -hmm. that if they just focus 90% of their effort on what they eat, the weight will literally come off. Like right. people don't understand, like they put all of this work and effort into, you know, going to those hit classes and, and get my ass kicked by the work and blah, blah, blah. But your nutrition, you cannot out exercise a bad diet. And if you have weight that you want to lose, weight is lost by changing your food 100%. Right. Exercise builds muscle, flexibility, and core strength that will help take you through the decades of life so that when you're 90 years old, you don't look like that little old decrepit woman that has, you know, a curve in her, her spine and has, you know, can't do the daily functions of life. Yes. That's why we exercise. We don't exercise to lose weight. If you want to lose weight, you have to change the food. Because, for example, my mom has really got on her health stuff with food and stuff and she has yeah. literally lost I think almost 20 pounds and she hasn't Mama been Gloria working. shout out she to Mama Gloria Woohoo! she hadn't been working out or anything but now I was telling mom I was like well mommy you losing weight but now like we need to start exercising and toning so it's just not you know so you have some type of definition but my point was she hasn't been working out but she really like got really like serious about you know what she eats and stuff and she's like it's dropping like I don't know it's just falling off yeah yeah and and the the first step that people can can do is go in their pantry their fridge and their freezer and get rid of the fake foods and I know that like there are food pantries that you can go donate that stuff to but just get it out of your house it's not good for you it's not good for your spouse it's not good for your kids get it out of the house because the higher the percent of, of fake foods and processed foods in a house, the higher percent of not just obesity, but diabetes, autoimmune disorder, uh, like sickness, sickness yes. is in your kitchen. 
And in your right. kitchen, you need to do a drastic overhaul and just get rid of the shit. Bottom yeah, line. You can't, and you can't, it's not, and I hear people say to me all the time, it's too expensive to eat healthy. I'm like, y'all, it's not expensive as you think. And you're going to eventually, if you keep going, you're going to eventually be paying doctor bills. I don't care what nobody's saying. You're going to eventually, you're going to keep going back to the doctor because you're not feeling good, whatever. If you get diabetes, whatever it is, like it's, you really have to choose like, okay, do I want to pay these doctor bills or do I want to, you know, really be healthy? But I feel like, I mean, I know it's more expensive, but it's not as expensive as people make it out. But see, but see, this is, this is where the fast food industry and food um, companies in general have you duped. They have you believing that you're going to spend less money if you go get the dollar menu at McDonald's and spend $4. Oh my God. Uh, and y'all, how on God's green earth do you think that is real food? Anywhere that you can go and get a four for four, you can get nuggets, a cheeseburger, fries for four dollars. <laughs> that is crappy food. Like, and how do you go? One day, um, one of my friends, she went, she was like, that food was crap. Uh, duh, it was four dollars. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you expect? But that that can't be real food they're selling. You getting burgers and all that four for four dollars. That that's crappy food. Yeah, yeah, no, and 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 it it is not. You can you can eat healthy if you are on a very tight budget. I promise you. And I just I got a message. Dana Nutt came up with hashtag Fits Mindset Movement to twenty twenty. I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. Shout out to Dana. I love it. I love it. Um, so, okay. So, I mean, it's, we're already 50 minutes into the show and we haven't even started on my favorites of, of this whole experiment. Um, I, I want to start off by, because look, I I started to show you my notepad. I wrote down all of these questions. (laughs) I literally went, because I I made two posts over the last week because I, I was getting so many questions in my DMs. I'm like, I, I want one place. So of course, Instagram and Facebook, I have to go check. So I wrote down all the questions and we haven't even gotten to them yet. Right. Um, so obviously this is going to be a two part series. So sorry. And for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So high fat, low carb. So let's start off with the difference between high fat, low carb versus keto. Okay. Cause this is a question that I get all the time. Um, and I don't consider myself keto, but I get into ketosis on a regular basis. And I do believe that there is a powerful movement that of keto people that are doing more harm than good, right? Um, but like with anything, with any trend, there are going to be people that want to um, take advantage of this trendy thing to make money. So mm-hmm. I will start off by saying that just because a food has the label keto on it, doesn't mean that it's good for you. Okay. And I see people do dirty keto, unhealthy keto, bad keto on a regular basis. And ultimately those people come back to me and are like, um, my hair is falling out. My menstrual cycle is all out of whack. Um, I, 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 my body is not functioning the way it's supposed to. Can you help me? And it's because keto has, has been done wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so the difference, do you, do you know the difference between high fat, low carb versus keto? Um, not really. Okay. No, I, I asked that on purpose because you are a highly educated person who has been health coaching. And I wanted to make the point that most people don't understand the difference. All right. Okay. So, um, so high fat, low carb versus keto. So the main difference is the one, let's talk macronutrients first. So rewind. We have three major macronutrients. We have fat, protein, and carbohydrates, okay? Now, of the three, we have essential fatty acids and we have essential amino acids, which that means, all that means is that our bodies can't make these these building blocks, so we have to get them from our diet. It's essential for us to live to get these essential fatty acids and essential amino acids. There are no essential carbohydrates because guess what? We have this thing called our liver and we actually, the liver can make its own glucose. Okay. Now let's also talk about the two energy sources. And those of you that follow me closely, you've heard this analogy multiple times. Um, but it, it's always good to hear it again. So we have two energy sources that we run on. It is just like a hybrid car. If you have a hybrid car, you 
mostly run on electricity until you have used up all that electricity. And then you have a backup energy source of fuel, because if you're on a long trip and you're not at a place that you can recharge your little Prius, then you need to be able to get to your destination, right? So our body functions on two different fuel sources, glucose and ketones, both of which we can make on our own. Okay. Now I personally believe that it hasn't been until the last about 40 or 50 years that we have had this paradigm shift of believing that our bodies were meant to mostly run on glucose. So the glucose was like the electricity, right? Mm -hmm. We, we believe that like, Oh, we, we, we can't survive without glucose, which is true. We can't, but we can make our own bodies glucose. But I believe that up until about maybe 50 ish years ago, fat was our main source of fuel and the glucose was the backup. But then all of the sudden, the whole paradigm, and I'm not going to get into this because this is a, a whole episode of its own. I'm not going to get into why, but this misbelief that fat in our diet leads to cardiovascular disease. And that is when the paradigm shift happened. So all of a the sudden, these food companies started taking out fat from the food, but it tasted like shit. <laughs> so... What do they do? They fill it with carbohydrates and sugars because we have to have food that tastes good so we will eat it, right? So all of a mm -hmm. sudden, the low-fat movement happened, the high-carbohydrate movement happened, and all of a sudden, we humans that have been existing on this earth for two and a half million years as omnivores, eating both wild-caught meat, wild-caught fish, and plants from the earth we mostly ran on fat because all of those have fat and protein mm -hmm. and minimal carbohydrates right but right. all of a sudden the shift of the low fat movement and now all of a sudden we go from being a mostly fat burner status to a sugar burner and man as, as we're approaching the one hour mark i'm like man <laughs> we're just getting into the good stuff um but i i do want to to talk about the the fat ver well okay let's finish answering the question and then we'll we'll go to questions on the, the the facebook page um but the main difference between the high fat low carb diet and the keto diet is the macronutrient breakdown okay so Fat, uh, the high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate. So write this down. So, and this is what I ultimately feel best on. So your total macronutrient breakdown at the end of, of each day, fat is between 50 to 60% of your, your total dietary intake. Your protein is between 25, 30, and then the rest is carbohydrates. Okay. So what does that look like? That looks like every single meal that I eat, sometimes I eat two meals a day, sometimes I eat three. I eat it in my eight-hour uh, eating window because I do practice intermittent fasting, and typically it's an eight-hour eating, 16-hour fasting. Um, uh -huh. So I will typically have my first meal break my fast around 11. Typically about four hours later, I'll have the second meal. This is on a day that I eat three meals a day. Um, and then four hours later, I will have my last meal, and each of those meals – have basically that same micronutrient or macronutrient breakdown. Uh, the, the highest majority of the calories are going to come from fat. Then I'm going to have an, a nice adequate amount of protein. So typically I try to have about 30 to 40 grams of protein. And typically it's closer to 30 mm -hmm. per meal if I'm doing three meals a day. And then my carbohydrates are from plants. So plants, veggies, seeds, nuts, um, fruit we're going to talk about next week because fruit's always the one. <laughs> Everyone's like, what? We'll talk about fruit and we'll get really geeky on what my thoughts are about fruit. But if you have someone that is truly doing keto, and there are definitely people that would benefit from doing a strict keto diet. So for example, if you have epilepsy, if I were given that diagnosis today, I would go on a strict ketogenic diet. So all I would do would shift my macronutrients to bump up the fat I would mm -hmm. decrease the protein, and this is going to be a key key element that I'm going to talk about, and then go to a total of 15 to 20 
net grams of carbohydrates in a day. And that is not a lot. So um, net carbohydrates basically is total carbohydrates minus fiber and minus sugar alcohols. Okay. So I want to, I want to warn the audience that all, especially with keto, there's all of these companies that are coming out with all of these processed keto cookies, keto bars, keto this, keto that, because they know that it makes a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean that it's good for you. Again, look at your ingredients. But the difference between a high fat, low carb lifestyle versus a ketogenic lifestyle has to do with that macronutrient breakdown. So a lot of people that are like, I'm doing keto. Well, when you actually get them to record what they're eating on a daily basis in, you know, my fitness pal or fat secret, fat secret is one I like to use. Um, they actually realize like, Oh, it's more of a high fat, low carb lifestyle versus a ketogenic lifestyle. Because a lot of people are one eating more than those, you know, 15 to 20 total net grams of carbohydrates. But two, the thing that I see for a lot of people is that they're eating too much protein that kicks them out of ketosis, which Mm -hmm. is not necessarily a good or bad thing. So we'll talk about that. We'll next week, we will pick up on that topic. And then I will get to all of these questions (laughs) because my timer says we are right at an hour. So, so I want to respect the listener's time, but I also want to um, answer any questions that you guys have. Um, So I'm going to have Jessica, I have it, it, rolled up here as well so I, 76 comments you guys are awesome i can't see them all though i don't know why can you see them all um yes okay you want to go ahead and start reading some of the I questions can see mo- i think i can see most of them okay trying right. to see all right let's see why is it not i'm gonna do this so go ahead and pick one to to, to read so a question I'm trying to find one. Okay. I mean, it's a lot. It's not so much. I mean, people are were saying so. It's not so okay. much questions. Okay. So okay. Fine. Is there a good time? Is there a good time of the of day or way to eat oatmeal? Because I love oatmeal and homemade granola, or just not at all. Mm, that's a great question. So, for me, um, I'm going to stay away from oatmeal because I saw what it did to my blood glucose. When I felt the best was when my blood glucose had basically just a nice rolling, like it kind of elevated and then it kind of went down. I felt the worst and I felt hungry when I would spike my blood glucose really high, which means that my insulin, my pancreas would be like, oh, here's some insulin to bring that sugar into the cell. And then it would spike it really low. Um, And the feelings of hunger that come along with that, that basically most people don't realize whether they're starting their day off with oatmeal or cereal or a bagel with, you know, Greek yogurt, like I'm thinking of all of the healthy breakfasts that I used to eat that just, and and all of those are basically sugar, 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 and sugar. Um, uh, The best way to start the day off um, is a breakfast that has fat, healthy fats and protein with little to no carbohydrates. And that will fuel you for the longest time. And, um, and again, breakfast is what whatever meal you break your fast with so it doesn't necessarily have to be first thing in the morning it's just your first meal so okay what other questions okay how do you get how do you get your nutrients while being vegan oh that's a great question so you can and again i'm not a nutrition expert um but out of all of the extensive reading and research and studying that i've done There's a lot of of nutrients that you can get from doing a vegan diet, doing it right. Um, Rich Roll is a great, he's one of the the most well-known vegans who, he's super wealthy. He lives in California. He's got a, a podcast. He's an endurance athlete. So he has the access to be able to do the vegan diet the right way and make sure that he gets all of his, his balanced nutrients the proper way. Um, my fear is that the average American is so far from that, that they are going to miss out. And, and the biggest one is, is B12. Um, that's the one that people always hear about, but, um, there is a, a score called the, the DIAS, D-I-A-S-S that basically talks about the bioavail- bioavailability of proteins. And it, it's a chart. And if you can imagine this chart at the top of the chart, it talks about, um, it, it shows, 
um, like um, animal protein and how bioavailable it is. And it shows the, the graph going all the way to the, the right hand side. And then it goes and it shows all the different kinds of protein. And so you get down to the vegan sources of protein and their bioavailability is, is much less than um, meat. And of course, next week we are going to talk about um not all meat is created equal. And if, if I'm at a place that I don't have the ability to order like a wild caught salmon, then I will actually order a vegan meal because I don't want to put in my body bad meat. And we'll talk about that next week. But, um, but yeah, it, it's, it is possible to get most of what you need, but it's really hard. And, uh, you know, if you don't have someone guiding you through that process, most people get it wrong and they end up with a ton of vitamin deficiencies and they become those patients that, you know, these doctors, these functional medicine doctors like vegans are some of the the sickest patients that I have. Mm -hmm. So we we need macronutrients, but we also need micronutrients. And that's where, um, you know, not just vegans there. I mean, trust me, there, there are ketonians and, 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 you know, the low fatters and, and high fat, low carbers that are, have vitamin deficiencies because they're not doing it right. You know? Okay. If you are eating high fat, low carb, but your carb number is higher than 10%, but, but your carbs are all from vegetables. Is that okay? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Here, this is, this is where I want people to realize, like, stop being dogmatic <laughs> because <laughs> guess what? If you eat 10% of carbohydrates today and you eat 12 tomorrow and then eight the next day, like your body isn't, isn't going to be like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to function. Like it is, it's all about balance. And, and this is where I see a lot of people, you know, getting so like legalistic. Um, but these numbers are just estimates and you are you won't know until you test yourself. You know, if, if you have a food that, you know, you really enjoy, see what it does to your blood glucose, see what it does to your energy, see what it does to your GI tract, see what it does to your skin, like all of these things that food affect. And then ultimately you make the decision. But, you know, if you eat, you know, if you're trying to do a low carb diet and, you know, you're at 11%, stop worrying about that kind of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Your body is so much smarter than that. Hey, girls, how many grams of protein roughly will kick you out of ketosis? And should you rotate out of ketosis? ketosis? That's a great question. Periodically. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk about that next week um, for sure. Uh, So everyone is different. The amount of grams of protein that will knock one person out of of ketosis versus another. And I'm going to next week, I'm going to talk about the difference between um, what, what has been coined nutritional ketosis versus deep ketosis. Um, What do you want to be in? Why do you want to be in one versus the other? Or maybe do you want to be in one at one time, one at the other? And um, the, the different, um, we have different, um, what's the word? not bioavailability, but basically everyone is different. And the only way that you're going to know is measuring. You have a a ketometer, you have a blood glucose monitor, and you have to self-experiment just like I've done with my, my own body. Right. So there Mm -hmm. isn't one like, Oh, magically you ate 30, 30 grams of protein. So now you're magically out of ketosis. Like it is different for everyone. And it also has to do with, um, if you're, you're fat adapted versus, um, you know, a sugar burner. So what we're going to talk about metabolic flexibility, um, why with my blood glucose is so low, pretty much since I started a low carb lifestyle, I haven't been symptomatic at all. Um, that's a a common question that I get and I'll, I'll cover that next week. But, um, but my, I, I am a, a, I've gotten major metabolic flexibility. So once I go from burning sugar, now I burn fat very easily. So I I don't feel the, the slumps of hypoglycemia that oftentimes people do when they first start. So we're, we're going to talk about that whole process next week. I promise. Okay. How many more do you want to take? Um, I, let's, what's your take on sweet potatoes? Um, sweet potatoes, I think are a great, great food. Um, I, I don't eat them every day. I think that they're a great, um, a healthy carbohydrate that, um, is very tasty, um, is really good for athletes as well. Um, 
but also they, they definitely spike my blood glucose. So it's not going to be a food that I eat daily. Um, I, now that I'm able to get back, well, once, you know, I'm done with this water fast thing. Um, when I get back into my regular routine, um, I typically will do what's what some people call cyclic ketosis. So a few days I will go into ketosis, um, purposefully, and then I will get out of it and get into either nutritional ketosis or knock myself out of ketosis completely. Um, with a, a meal that has some sweet potatoes and whatnot. So we'll, we'll talk about that definitely more next week. But good question. Lauren, will you talk a bit about need for carbs, for cardio and weightlifting, et cetera? Also, I was sitting at a dinner table the other night and a mom was talking about the need for unhealthy carbs to help her daughter gain weight. And I wanted to cry. Would you share your thoughts on the opposite of wanting to lose weight when people want to gain weight and help in the healthy way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I believe that when you feed your body the way it's supposed to, your body is going to go to the weight that it function at the be- functions at the best, right? So some people want to lose weight. Other people want to gain weight. Um, I, I do know that it, it hasn't, I, I believe the first book that was written, a first low carb book that was written um, was back in like 1890 by um, a doctor. It's, it's, it's like something of opulence or something, but he basically was the first doctor to put to, to word that the way to fatten up um, patients, you know, and he was talking about, I believe cancer patients, not cancer patients, but Un, unthriving patients um, was to, to feed them a, a diet super high in carbohydrates. So we know that that's a way to fatten them up, but ultimately we, we don't want to fatten mm-hmm. them up to the place that they get non-fatty liver that leads to insulin resistance that leads to beta cell dysfunction. And we're going to talk about all of that geeky stuff next week. My doctor su- suggested a low keto diet. Is there a such thing? A low keto diet. <laughs> I have never heard of a low keto diet. They probably meant a low carb keto diet because that honestly, and you know, ultimately I think most people want to know what I think is the best. Um, and again, it's just for me. I think that going back and forth in between a high fat, low carb and doing a ketogenic diet maybe a day or two a week is how I will go back to, to functioning. And that's how I've been for the the longest time. That's why I just call myself a low carber because I do believe my body works better on low carbs. I believe that, that the, the beta cell dysfunction, the high, the insulin resistance that I was showing at 35, I've reversed um, because I changed to a low carb lifestyle. And I think that those are the people that benefit the most from the low carb lifestyle. So I bet that that's what the doctor was recommending. Um, and, and let me just be the first person to say, you guys have heard me say this before, but most medical doctors get minimal to no nutritional training. And that's why, you know, anytime I talk about anything, nutrition, I get attacked by people that have a a nutrition degree. Um, but (laughs) it, it is real. Most MDs and DOs don't know anything about, about nutrition. They don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And you know, (sighs) If, if they don't look healthy either, it's hard for me mm-hmm. to take diet advice from a doctor that doesn't know how to feed themselves healthy either. Mm-hmm. And it's not doctor's fault, uh, you know, because we're not taught. We're not taught how to, to feed the body, you know, in a healthy way. And this is why having a health coach is so beneficial because this journey is not easy. Um, your, your taste buds have been hijacked by all these fake foods and you you really are... I, the minimum amount of time I like to work with a, a client is three months because that is the minimum amount of time that it takes for me to undo some of these lifetime unhealthy habits and replace them with good healthy habits of learning how to truly feed the body with whole foods, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. T- time for a few more she questions. Said his, she said his concern, the question I just asked, she said his concern was me being insulin resistant. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if your doc is, is concerned about insulin resistant, he wants you to go on a low carb, a low carb diet. And and that's the thing. So many people confuse high fat, low carb with keto because both are low carbohydrates. Um, but it has to do with, if you're doing pure keto, 
you are being really strict and really minimizing the total amount of carbohydrates that, that you are consuming versus on low carb. It's, it's mostly you're trying to stay at that about 10 to 15% of your total macronutrients. And then also the amount of protein uh, is that, you know, it's, it's moderate on the high fat, low carb. It's, it's lower on the, the ketogenic because most like 80, 80 to 90% of your, what you consume is fat. So, and, and again, uh, doing keto all day, every day, the rest of your life, I don't believe is sustainable. And I don't want to teach, um, the people that I work with something that's not just sustainable for life, a high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate lifestyle with intermittent fasting and whole foods is 100 million percent sustainable for life. You eat good food. You don't feel deprived. Like you, you don't, you don't feel the, the hunger pangs all the time. You don't, you have so much more energy. Like there's so many benefits I'm going to talk about next week. So yeah, let's do one more question. Okay. I'm just going in order. Okay. Um, good morning. Is high fat, low carb nutrition, a healthy option for individuals who want to be heart healthy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course I'm a medical doctor, but not your medical doctor. Um, but this is where I love to, to ask, um, a, a follower uh, who asks a question like this to, to find a functional medicine doctor, um, because functional medicine doctors are definitely up to date on the, the lack of evidence that fat has any connection with cardiovascular disease. Like there is zero connection. It's all terrible science and that whole story it has to do with a, a man named Ansel Keys who wasn't even a medical doctor he was a physiologist and had this he basically skewed his data of his research and basically hijacked our, our American food system to convince everyone that fat was the evil component in their diet that would lead to heart attacks and lead to death and it, it was just wrong so um, my experience is that I, I don't require people to get labs before they start working with me. Um, but as a functional medicine doctor, obviously I will, which I'm really excited about. But um, oftentimes clients will get their labs drawn and I love to see what they do. Typically, um, lab findings that change when they go, they do the low carb lifestyle the right way. They'll typically see an increase in the good cholesterol, the HDL. They'll see a decrease in their triglycerides, their triglycerides, man, that is one of the most important things. Um, their, their overall ratio, um, becomes better and, and typically their abdominal circumference goes down and that, that is directly related to visceral fat. So, um, so this is why I'm going to end this with talking about Tofi. Tofi is thin on the outside fat on the inside and visceral fat is the fat that is inside our organs. The fat that you can't see, um, unless you get an actual, like a, a DEXA scan. Um, there's, a, or if you want to get a CT scan or, you know, you can see the visceral fat on certain invasive tests, right? Um, fatty liver, you can see via ultrasound, but, uh, you know, I go back to my friend that was diagnosed with type two diabetes. I mean, she is thin as a rail. You'd never guess, but I bet you anything. She's Tofi. I bet you she has major visceral fat and you would never, ever guess that. So, all right. Man, we've talked an hour and 17 minutes. Granted, Joe Rogan, I mean, he's, you know, one of the best, but he, his, his podcasts go like three, three hours plus. So I guess an hour and 17 Ooh. isn't so bad. I know. <laughs> right so no thank you so it, are are there any more questions that you want to actually um, take care of right now i know i just said one more but I'll get, what about concerns of high cholesterol on a high fat low carb diet i man i i one i don't i don't am not concerned about cholesterol um the the pharmaceutical company is the only element of your cholesterol that they have figured out that they can change is the LDL and that's the statin drug group, right? And it's a billion, multi-billion dollar drug industry and come to find out our LDL really doesn't, it's really not the thing that we need to worry about, but getting people to understand a good book to read where he goes into um, a, a good explanation is why we get fat by Dr. Mark Hyman. He is a functional medicine doctor as well. And, and he, talks about and breaks down like I, why you don't need to be on a statin <laughs> ultimately so that breaking this making a paradigm shift where people 
are no longer concerned about cholesterol the way we have been taught to. I want you to eat the egg yolk. I want you, I mean, our body, our hormones, our, our, our body needs cholesterol to function. Our, our hormones are actually biologically made of cholesterol. We need cholesterol. Um, a, a good test that, that I ask, and oftentimes is not covered by insurance, is uh, there's two different kinds of cholesterol tests that there's the cardio IQ and the NMR. Um, one is by, oh, man, one is by Quest Diagnostic. I think cardio IQ is by Quest Diagnostic and NMR is by LabCorp, I believe. Um, but these look, these are invasive tests that look at the particle size of LDL because if someone comes back with, you know, bad cholesterol, the LDL being high, um, it doesn't tell me exactly what I, I want to know because if it comes back high, but it's mostly large, fluffy um, particles, then I'm not concerned. But if it comes back with small, dense particles, then I start to get more concerned. But most doctors, when they send a cholesterol panel, they're not testing for this. And I believe that it's because, one, pharmaceutical companies don't want us to know this. And insurance companies don't want us to know this either because a, a lot of people are on cholesterol lowering medicines that don't need to be. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, we've talked a lot and we haven't even like scraped the surface of all these questions that were left. Um, but next week we will address the, um, the, the nine days that I enjoyed the most of this self CGM test the three days of high fat, low carb, then the three days of keto, and then the three days of carnivore. Um, and uh, we will answer all of the questions, but I appreciate you guys so much. Um, and if this has been helpful so far, please share it. Um, please go to patreon.com forward slash fits and healthy. And we will see you guys next Thursday. Podcast brought to you from the creative minds of Jessica Young and Lauren Fitzgerald. Make sure to follow, like, subscribe, and add to your playlist on Podbeam, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Spotify. New episodes drop every Friday. I appreciate your time listening so much. If you enjoyed this episode of the Fits and Healthy podcast, can you please go do me a favor and go subscribe at whatever platform that it is that you listen to podcasts. Leave a review. We read every single review and we appreciate the time that you take to leave your thoughts and opinions. Now, also remember, while I am a medical doctor, the information I provide here is not intended to provide medical advice or a professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or to any other individual. I am providing general information for educational and informational purposes only, and it is not a substitute for medical or professional care. You should not use this information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other healthcare provider. The information I share is not intended to treat, cure, or diagnose any disease or medical condition. If you believe you have a medical emergency, just call 911 immediately or your physician. Now, enough of that medical legal jargon. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I appreciate your time. Now, go live a fit and healthy life.